All right, you ready to go? It is Palm Sunday. It is Palm Sunday. Happy, happy Palm Sunday. If you're new to the church, and I don't necessarily mean Parkwood, maybe you're like new to the church, and uh, you're not exactly sure what Palm Sunday is, it's, it's the week before Easter, and, and what it is, we just kind of celebrate the fact that uh, that, that scene in the Gospels where, where it was Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it says that as he was riding in on a lowly donkey, it says that people were throwing down their cloaks and palm branches before him. And they were shouting out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the, the, the Pharisees, right, they're kind of witnessing this. They're the kind of religious leaders of the day. And, and they approach Jesus and they say, Jesus, tell them to stop. Why? Because they're calling you king. And then it was in this moment that Jesus made an amazing statement. He said, let them, let them go, let them call out, because if they stop, the rocks will cry out. That's a really cool way of Jesus just saying, I am king. I am the king. And so what we do on Palm Sunday is just, we celebrate that. You know, sometimes when it comes to Jesus, we think that, uh, we get this impression, I don't know where it comes from, but that Jesus was just kind of like this meek, mild man, always in the distance, not really uh, saying strong things. He didn't have a lot of opinions. And, and sometimes it gets spun that like Christians, right, we have a higher view of Jesus than he had of himself. I'm telling you, that's actually not true. Okay? Jesus had an incredibly high opinion of himself. He did. Like he says, Palm Sunday, yeah, I'm king. And in fact, this entire sermon series that we're in right now on the I am statements of Jesus are all about these powerful statements that Jesus made, right? Uh, he says, before Abraham was, I am, right? He takes that personal self-description of God uh, given to Moses in the burning bush, and he says, yeah, let's make no mistake about this. I'm him. I am was the God who was speaking in the burning bush. Now, that's, just, that's a cool statement, right? But he goes on from there. He says, I'm the bread of life. I'm an endless supply of everything you will ever need. He says, I'm the light of the world, right? He's saying, I've come to illuminate the path for you in this dark world. And then last week, we were teaching on I am the gate, that he is the entrance way to salvation. And today, as we look at the next I am statement of Jesus, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, there's actually nine verses that I want to read, and then I'm going to pull some stuff out. But right now, uh, I, I just want us to read it all together. Okay, here it is, nine verses. And Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you abide in me as I also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches." If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not abide in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now abide in my love. This is the word of the Lord. That's just a good passage of scripture, is it not? Oh, so today as we continue on, the next I am statement that Jesus makes is this, I am the vine. I am the vine. Uh, my wife, Natalie, has two brothers, uh, Greg and Jeff Sykes. Both of them live in Niagara-on-the-Lake. Now, I want to be clear, not Niagara Falls, okay? Niagara-on-the-Lake is a lot nicer than Niagara Falls. It, it's like Niagara-on-the-Lake, have you ever been there before? It's, it's wine country. It's, it's, it's kind of like Windsor-Essex, but instead of fields of corn, they have fields of grapevines, 
uh, which are just prettier to look at. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful area. And so pretty much for the last 15 years of my life, I've been taking several trips a year to this region of land. Uh, spent a lot of time there. I, I, I know it well. And over the years, uh, I've from a distance, albeit, but, but I've kind of just been watching all the care that goes into the grapevines. And it's a year-round process. Uh, there's a season of planting. There's a season of harvesting. And even in the brutal, cold winters in Canada, there's even a, se- a season of, of pruning where you kind of cut it back to ensure that you get the most and best grapes available. But what I want you to see is this today, the grapevine, because This picture, okay, this is the backdrop that Jesus made the entire statement that we just read. Everything that he was saying there was wrapped up in the imagery of the grapevine. So today what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time looking at all the different pieces here because Jesus spent time (laughs) breaking it down for us so that we would see it clearly. So, But before we do... Uh, as always, when we come to our text, we just have to ask the question, okay, so what's the setting? Who did Jesus say this to and why? Well, what he did is he says this statement, I am the vine, to his disciples at the Last Supper, right? Which kind of begs the question, why? Like, Like he's moments before his betrayal, he's moments before being beaten, he's moments before his death, he knows it. And he spends some of his last words in this very important uh, time with the disciples painting this picture. Why? Why? Because he knows what's coming. And he knows what's coming not just for himself, he knows what's coming for them. He knows that in the very near future that they are going to experience hardship on a level in which they've never seen before. He knows the emotional struggles, the mental struggles, the physical struggles, and dare I say, even spiritual struggles that they're going to face. And so what he does is he speaks to these people at this time, in this moment, at that setting to paint a picture because what he wants to do is he wants to encourage them And he wants to strengthen them for the very difficult days ahead. And out of this passage that we just read, there's a lot in it, like a lot. And today, honestly, I don't have time to pick out every single piece that that Jesus said. But what I want to do for us today is I I, want to explain this from the perspective of Jesus. And then I'm going to leave us with one big thought. Are are, are you ready to go? Okay. Okay. So there's kind of three encouragements. Uh, honestly, a part of it's a warning, right? He's, this is the words of Jesus in that very dire moment, okay? Here's the first encouragement that he gives us. Take a note so you can write this down. Jesus is the vine, okay? Now, this is the obvious one, right? It's a sermon called I Am the Vine. So something Jesus said, right? But, but I want you to see it. The vine is like the trunk, Okay? The vine is the part that's connected to the ground. The, the, the vine is the part that's rooted. The vine is the part that brings life to everything else. Okay? Apart from the vine, in the words of Jesus, you can do nothing. There's no life apart from the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine. Now, actually, there's two different times in this passage that we read that Jesus said, I'm the vine. But the first time in verse 1, he throws in an additional word. Watch this. John 15, 1, he says, I am the true vine. Which seems to indicate that there's other vines out there, doesn't it? Because there are. Jesus doesn't hide that. Jesus doesn't say, I'm the only vine. He says, I'm the true vine. Right? He's, what he's doing is he's, he's communicating uh, to his disciples in this moment that there are a lot of other things out there. There's, a, there. there's other vines out there. There's other options out there. But in me, you have something that is true. In me, you have something that is right. In me, you, you this is Jesus' way of saying, I am the real deal. 
and every other vine out there is just a cheap counterfeit. Let me explain. This might not be the best illustration, but it popped in my head this week. When I was young, like eight, there were these shoes that were really popular at the time. They were high top uh, Nike Airs. You know, they were like basketball shoes, even though I didn't play basketball. I wanted them, right? And they were these beautiful shoes. And right down the side of the shoe in big bubble letters, three letters, A-I-R, it was the Nike Airs. And they were amazing. So I did what every kid did, is I begged my parents for these shoes. (laughs) So we went to the mall. Back then, uh, it wasn't Sport Check. I think it was National Sports. Wasn't that the store? Anyway, I go into the store. We're looking around. We find the pair in my size. It was an amazing moment. And then my parents found the price tag. (laughs) (laughs) And knowing that I was not running up and down basketball courts, I was going to go like jump in muddy puddles. (laughs) My parents like, no, we're not. We're not buying you these shoes. But then my parents did what a lot of parents did. We left that store. We walked down the hallway to Payless. Anybody ever gone to Payless? Yeah. Yeah. Payless is where you go when you want to pay less. Okay? Payless is like the store of knockoff shoes. (laughs) And and so we, we went into that store, and lo and behold, we found a pair of shoes that was almost exactly the same. It was a white, high-top basketball shoe. It had three big letters going down the side, except these shoes didn't spell air. They spelled rad. (laughs) R-A-D. So I was like, do you want these? I'm like, well, it's better than nothing. So, (laughs) So I walked around school in my rad shoes. (laughs) Now granted, these shoes didn't last as long. (laughs) They probably weren't nearly as comfortable. But they also didn't cost as much, right? Like like, like this was the picture, right? And and I know this is like a really weird illustration, but I just want to say it this way. Jesus is not a pair of rad knockoffs from Payless, (laughs) okay? Do Do you see where I'm going with this, okay? Like, He is the real deal, okay? He's not a cheap imitation. He is the real deal. He says right here, I am the true vine, right? Go back into the context, right? He he knows what's about to happen. He knows his disciples, the struggles they're gonna face. He says there's gonna be other options, There's going to be other scenarios. There's going to be other religions. And what you need to know right now is there's coming a time I'm not going to be here like I am right now, physically present. There's a day you're not going to see me in this way. And what you need to know first and foremost is that I am the true vine. Nothing can fill you, satisfy you, or grow you like I can. That's the picture. He is the true vine. Vine. This is the first encouragement that he gives, but it's not the only one. Here's the second encouragement. Take a notes, write this down. We are the branches. Now, listen, I know some of you, you're like, that doesn't seem like an encouragement. It is. And l- honestly, l- let, me, let me tell you why. Sometimes when Jesus spoke, and he would give these parables or these metaphors, it was kind of like shrouded in like mystery. But not here. Th- this one's not. Here, Jesus wants us to know exactly who he is, and he wants us to know exactly who we are. He says, I'm the vine, and you, disciples, you, my followers, you, church, you're the branch. You are the thing that grows only because you're connected to the vine. Let's look at this, verse 5. We'll pull it out. Jesus says, I am the vine. That's the second time he says it. He says, you are the branches. And he says, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. I love this. Is apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me hear you say the word nothing. 
Isn't that an encouraging word? You can do nothing <laughs> by yourself. Honestly, this is encouraging. Jesus is showing us here what works and what doesn't. And he says this, you don't work. You can't do it. Only I can. Like, it's, it's very important. Like, this is a loving statement. He's giving us the truth. You don't have what it takes. But listen, I, I don't know who needs to hear this message right now, but let me just say it, okay? You are not the vine. Your spouse is not the vine. Your kids are not the vine. Your employer is not the vine. Your bank account is not the vine. Our government is not the vine. Jesus is the vine. He is the only vine. We, we are this nice part up here. We're like the foliage, <laughs> right? At, at, at the top. We're the thing that grows only because we are connected to the vine. And what Jesus says, he says, if you, the branch, if you, the branch, are connected to me, the vine, he says, you will bear much, what? Fruit. So we have to talk about this. What's the fruit? Well, here's a very interesting thing that I'm going to tell you that you all already know. Ready? Fruit will always bear the character of the tree to which it is a part. Amen. You understand? This is why you won't find pears on apple trees or oranges on pear trees, right? Like fruit will always bear the character to which it is a part. So when Jesus says, when you branch, when you church are connected to me, the vine, you will become like me. This is Jesus' way of saying, listen, if you're in me, the fruit of your life will actually be, it will become my very character, who I am will begin to grow in you. And this is exactly what Galatians teaches, right? Paul teaches the church in Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit of God is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. What does God want to do? He wants us to grow fruit. He wants, he wants to actually grow the fruit on us. So what, what is that? What is the fruit? It is him. It is his very character. And the more that we abide in the vine, the longer that we stay connected into the vine, the longer that we walk with Jesus, trust Jesus, his very character, who he is, begins to grow in us. So this is the first two encouragements. It's pretty good so far, right? Right? And he says, here's what you need to know. It's, a, it's about to get rough, right? I'm the vine. Don't mistake yourself for me. I'm the vine, Jesus says. And then he says, you, church, you are the branches. You are the beneficiaries of my greatness. Okay? It's encouraging. And here's the third thing. The third thing Jesus wants us to see is this, that the Father is the gardener. The Father is the gardener. Now, I don't, um, how many people here, you're, you're, like, you, you're a gardener. You take your garden seriously. Yeah, God bless you all. Uh, <laughs> I don't have this gift. <laughs> I don't have this passion. I honestly, like most of what I know, I've actually learned from my mother-in-law. She's great at this. She's got a passion for it. Uh, but for me, it just doesn't come natural. And so even kind of understanding what Jesus was saying here, I kind of had to dig deep to kind of wrap my head into it. But let's just read two more verses. John 15, 1 and 2 this time. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So there's two things here that God the gardener does. You know, it's funny. Uh, somebody dropped off in my office this week these little shears that you hold in one hand, and I thought, that's not nearly dramatic enough. <laughs> so I went and got these. <laughs> the first thing the gardener does says that he will come alongside and he will cut off 
every branch that bears no fruit. This is sobering. Like, there's actually no part of this, um, what's going to come out of my mouth next that I take pleasure in. But the reality is, and I need you all to, to listen very carefully, if you are exhibiting no fruit in your life, you have no love for the Lord in your heart, no desire to be with him or to be like him, then I love you enough in this moment to tell you that you may not be saved. Now listen, I also want to throw in here, I'm not God, and I'm not the judge. I don't know who's in and who's out. That's not my job at all. But in the same way that a doctor will not look at a cancer patient and tell them that they have a cold for fear of hurting their feelings, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it's not that bad when maybe it is. This is the picture that Jesus leaves us with. It's a massive warning to the church. Is this, that, that, that he will cut off the branches that bear no fruit. Now, here's the good news. You ready? If you're breathing, it's not too late. Okay? This is the good news. The day of cutting away has not happened yet. And my prayer for you is that if this is you, like this morning, if you're, like even in this moment, you're just, man, I think that's me. Listen, my prayer for you in this moment is that you would not waste this opportunity, but that you would run to the vine of life. That you would turn away from all the other false vines out there and that you would run to the true vine, Jesus Christ. It is not too late. Amen. This is the good news. This is the good news, but, but it is a warning. The first thing the father does is he cuts away. The second thing that the father, God the father, the gardener does, is it says that he will not cut away, but he will cut back. It's a pruning that he will actually cut back those of us who do have fruit, right? So, so this idea, again, this is where I had to spend some time on Google. But what he does is he intentionally cuts us back to make room for more grapes to grow. Now this is not comfortable. Okay, can we just acknowledge that? It's not comfortable, but it is the way of Jesus. Right? So the, so the, the first end is this, is that if you're, if, if you're not in me, he says, you have no vine, no love for the Lord, no desire to be with him, I'm th that really sobering image you get cut down. This image is for every follower of Jesus. Is that there are times, now, now the image is like this, that, that sometimes what happens with these grape vines is that the branches become so overgrown, so wild, that it will actually impede future growth. So the gardeners come along, the farmers come along, and they have, they have to cut off the extra wild pieces to make room for, for more grapes. Likewise, there may be areas of our lives that have just grown out of control, wildly out of control. And because God is good and because God is loving, he will come alongside of us and he will cut us back to make room for more grapes to grow. And, and he'll use all sorts of different ways to do this. Uh, the, the God, the gardener, uh, one way, it's just through the scriptures. You ever read the scriptures and you're reading a passage of scripture and it's like a knife just goes into your heart? You know what that is? That's the, that's the father pruning you. You know, there's these moments where, honestly, the father will use circumstance. You find yourself in a situation, a trial. God will use those things to open up our eyes, to prune us back. God will use people. God will use pastors. God will use friends. Someone doesn't want to hear this, but God will even use your spouse. Right? You're like, oh, let it be anyone else. No, like, <laughs> God will use whatever he wants. 
But the desire, the aim is what I want you to see, is that he will cut us back so that more fruit will grow. Better fruit will grow. He is good and he is loving for this. So this is the encouragements that Jesus gave to the church in a very difficult night. He says, here's what you need to know. I'm the vine. I'm the source. I am the thing that is rooted and that will bring life to everything else. You, you're the branch. You're the beneficiaries of everything that I have to offer. And if you remain in me, you're going to get much fruit. You're going to grow much fruit. Now, and, and then here's the third thing. He says, you need to see that my father is the gardener. He cuts off and he cuts back. Be encouraged and be warned. This is Jesus's very real message that he gives his followers on that night. Worship team, can you guys come on back up? You're going to help me somewhat wrap this, land this plane. Can I just tell you one of the worst things that can happen with a message like this? And I, and I want to, one of the worst things that could happen right now is for you to say, well, I don't want to be this guy. So I need to bear more fruit. I need to work harder. I need to do more things. I need to, I, 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 I need to go. I need to figure this, this out. Can I just say, no, no. <laughs> That is not the lesson. The lesson is not try harder, push harder. No. What you need to do, friend, listen, is you need to learn how to abide in the vine. You cannot bear fruit by yourself. I don't care how hard you try. You don't have what it takes Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So the, the, the takeaway this morning is not, oh, I gotta work harder, I gotta try harder. I gotta. No, you need to abide. Honestly, I don't know if there's another passage of scripture anywhere in the Bible like, that it reiterates the same point over, or definitely in Jesus' writings, but I just want you to listen for the word abide. In verse four, Jesus says, abide in me as I also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Verse five, he says, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Verse six, if you do not abide in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away. Verse seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse nine, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now abide in my love. Parkwood, do you see it? Do you see the heart of God? What he wants more than anything else is for you to just abide in him, spend time with him. You don't need to do more stuff. You don't need to figure it all out. You don't need to be the smartest one in the room, the most successful one in the room, the prettiest one in the room, the strongest one in the room. You just need to abide. You just need to spend time with him. Can I just tell you, like something that I've learned is that abiding in Jesus is actually the answer to all of life's problems. I don't know what you're facing, but I know the solution. The vine is the answer to all of life's problems. Like maybe you're here today and man, you just anger, malice, rage, jealousy. How do you get through that? Read another self-help book? No. Abide in the vine. Maybe it's, I don't know, you're just wrapped up in some secret addiction that no one knows and you keep it hidden from everyone else. It's it's the lust, the pornography. Maybe it's you're sleeping around with different people. Friend, can I tell you right now, your only hope is to abide in the vine. 
Maybe you have racial prejudice. And even though it doesn't come out all that much because you know that it is wildly socially unacceptable in today's world, doesn't mean it's not there. So what do you do? You abide in the vine. Maybe you're struggling as a parent. Maybe you're struggling as a son or a daughter. Maybe you're struggling with evangelism and reaching the lost. Maybe it's you just, you know that you should be compassionate and care about the hurting and the loss, but yet it's just not there. What do you do? You abide in the vine. The vine is the answer to whatever it is you're struggling with right now. Jesus is the answer to whatever you're struggling with right now. And so he just says, would you just abide in me? There's a a beautiful story. Can we stand on up to our feet? In Luke, Luke's gospel, chapter 10, there's this story where Jesus goes into a certain village and he finds Mary and Martha, these two sisters. He knows them well and he goes inside their house with these disciples and he's sitting inside the house and he's teaching, he's unpacking uh, the mysteries of the kingdom and, and it's this beautiful scene and then you have the one sister, Martha, and she's doing a good thing. A good thing. She's, she wants to serve Jesus. Now to understand 2,000 years ago, Middle Eastern culture, hospitality is at like a high level. So when this group come in her house, Martha is right for what she does. She is busy trying to get the food and, and, and clean the house. She's just busy trying to kind of be, be hospitable. She, 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 she wants to welcome them in the best way that she knows how. And she's working and she's running and she's, I, I picture her sweating, right? Like it's just this, she's going at this frenetic pace. The problem is, is Mary, the other sister. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's not with her sister at all. She's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, spending time with him, listening to his words. Well, this Martha has no time for. And the longer this goes on, it's frustrating her and frustrating her. So eventually what she does and she goes to Jesus and she tells him, Jesus, tell my sister to help. Which I love when people try to tell Jesus to do something. <laughs> she says, I'm doing all this. I'm trying to serve you the best way that I know how. And she's just sitting there. And I love what Jesus says. He says, Martha, Martha. You're worried about many things, but only one thing is needed. And she has chosen what is best. She has, Mary, I know it looks like she's just sitting down on the job. She's not. She's spending time with me. It's a beautiful story. of two sisters, one who's doing a good thing, in one who's doing the better thing. Can I tell you, church, yes, there's a time to serve Jesus. Yes, there's a time to evangelize. Yes, there's a time to go. But only one thing is needed. Only one. And that is to sit at the feet of Jesus. That is to remain in the vine. This is what he wants. And it's funny, what I've just learned in my life is that the more time that I spend in the vine, the more time that I actually spend just sitting at the feet of Jesus, 
all that other stuff that I mentioned a little bit ago from the temptations, the sins, to the struggles, to the parenting, all that stuff just begins to work itself out. The answer to all of life's problems is sitting at the feet of Jesus. What I believe in this moment, and I I felt it this week, is that God wanted to speak over our church and just say, there is a lot of Marthas out there. And you're doing good things. You're serving Jesus as best as you know how. It's good, it's right, but it's not best. One thing is needed, only one. And that is you sit at the feet of Jesus. In fact, you know what's really interesting? Jesus says one thing is needed and Mary has chosen what is right. You have to choose to be in the vine. Can I tell you? Like, God's not gonna force you into the vine. You have to choose to do the one thing that's needed. And friends, what I'm saying right now, I guarantee for the vast majority of us, this isn't the first time you've heard this. This is kindergarten Christianity. This is what I spend all my time trying to get my five-year-old daughter to understand. And yet it's funny as we grow up, we move on to all this other stuff and we miss it. The most important thing, Jesus says, the one thing I want is for you to spend time with me. I'll I'll close with this. Friday night, I was here um, hanging out with some of the high school students. Uh, Pastor Alex last Friday night with us and kind of towards the end of the night, one of the leaders felt like God was just impressing this word. And she just said that what God is asking you for is your time. And she was, honestly, I believe that word was for the youth that night, but I don't think it was an accident that I was there knowing that I was gonna preach this message in 48 hours. But can I just tell you, Parkwood, right now, what God is after is your time. That you would actually, what he wants is for you to make room for him. We get so busy. I already mentioned earlier in the service, we get so busy. I mean, I've had people sit in my office and tell me, I can't read my Bible, I can't pray, I can't spend time with with God, I'm too busy. Friend, if that's you, you are too busy. Something has to go. You have to make room (laughs) for God. Because it is only there when we actually make room with him and we abide in him, it is only then that all that other stuff, your anxieties, your worries, your challenges, it is only then that it will begin to work out. So here's the call this morning. Don't just do the good stuff. Do the best stuff. Sit at the feet of Jesus. We're gonna sing this song that we sang earlier in the service. It's a simple, very simple song. It just calls make, it's make Room. And I will make room for you to come and do what you want to, God. As we sing this song, I just want to encourage us, even in this moment right now, this is so much bigger than this moment, but we do have this moment. Church, would we make room to sit at the feet of Jesus and just be with him?